Oh boy. I'll wait for a few minutes. I'll wait for a few minutes. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. God bless each and every one of you. Good afternoon. God bless you. Um, I just want to tell, this is not going to be that long. I just want to be able to tell everybody um, to please, please, please um, pray for your teachers and administrators that our um school district currently has especially um i can only speak from um the middle school level um but our young people right now these generations of young people are really struggling to find direction they are struggling to find themselves they have a lot of trauma that they are dealing with and um i play like a double role i'm just kind of just giving this out, you know, I play a double role, maybe even a triple role as a community leader, um, as a political um, representation for our, um, our community, um, as a pastor, uh, as a mom, you know, um, who has a child in our inner city school districts. And I'm finding that where there are clusters of um people who live in urban areas who are devastated or traumatized by the poverty that they are currently experiencing, I'm finding that that is pouring out into the classroom and it's pouring out onto the school teachers and onto the administrators. I need everyone who knows a word of prayer to pray with me, um, to pray for our leaders in the schools, to pray for our administrators Pray for our youth pastors. Pray for um, our young people. And, and we're, we're pouring in prayers and we're saying, you know, yeah, we need to pray for our young people. Let me tell you something. Some of these young people do not know God. They don't know God. They don't know anything about God. They don't know anything about church. Not in, not, And I want to be, oh, I want to be so careful how I say this. But I'm not talking about church as the institution because some parents have been so hurt by the church that they have taught their children that the church is a place for hurt. I'm talking about people who do not have a relationship with God. They don't have a relationship with the inner part of themselves. I'm talking about adolescents and I'm talking about generations of parents who do not have a relationship with God. There are some people who believe that the institution, I'm talking about the institutional church, I'm talking about the churches that have hurt people, the churches that have become social clubs, the, the churches that have become competitive in its in their nature to whereas people People will come into the church house or come into the sanctuary and they will feel as though they are immediately judged and immediately into competition. These are the children of the parents are these are the children of those parents, of those people who have been church hurt, who have been rejected, who have been judged, who have been felt to be that they're less than and they have turned away from God because of the representation that they have received in the church, in the in what is supposed to be the body of Christ, what is supposed to be a place of comfort, a place of care. And so I'm trying not to get too emotional, but what I'm starting to see, what I'm starting to see in our classrooms is that these children are so hurt and they are so traumatized by poverty, by homelessness, by lack of being able to educate themselves. They are so traumatized by domestic violence and even some of these young girls by child sexual abuse. Oh yeah, it's real. My question is, where are the people, where is the body of Christ? Where are the people who would like to, who, who want to reach out 
to try to help these, these people because this is the church. This is the church. We are waiting for people to come into our doors to worship a God that they don't know. Come on, this is good stuff. And here's the thing, people of God, they're coming. There are some people who have been so traumatized in their lives. There are some people who are being so devastated. They have made the government some kind of God to them, some type of idol to them. And now that they're finding that the government will not answer their questions, now they're going to try this Jesus. <laughs> now they're going to try God. Now they're going to try to come to worship and going to, and here's the thing, let's not reject them when they come, but are we as a body of Christ prepared, hey God, to receive them? Are you prepared to receive the people that are coming and that are going to be, that are coming with their issues, that are coming with their trauma? Are you prepared? Is your church ready to respond to mental illness? Is your church ready to respond to teenagers who are 11, 12, and 13 years old that have never heard the Lord's prayer said to them, that don't even know how to pray? And the reason why they feel so hopeless and so left out and feel so much shame, and the reason why they can't concentrate in the, in the classrooms is because they don't have enough of a relationship with themselves or with God because their parents don't have enough of a relationship with themselves or with God because their parents didn't have enough relationship with themselves or with God because their parents were on drugs or there was a war on drugs or a war on crack or our, our, our communities were infiltrated with, with, with drugs and alcohol and domestic violence. What, what are we going to do? Now, here's the thing, people of God. We have people that are teaching our children in the classrooms that may or may not have a, rela a relationship with God. Thank you, Pastor um, Smith, for saying that. Yes. Are we prepared or are we still preaching messages of oppression? Yes. I believe that. Are we serving a God of the oppressed or are we serving a God of oppression? Come on. There are teachers in our classrooms that may or may not have a relationship with God. And I'm not talking about God, you know, little G God. I'm talking about the almighty, wonderful God that exists not only inside of each and every one of us, but is the master and creator of the universe. Sometimes the, 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 these kids, these young people, and I can only speak from my own circumference. I can only speak from the scope that I deal with, but I'm dealing with these 11, 12, and 13 year olds who have been traumatized in their life. They're dealing with poverty. Their parents are dealing with poverty. Their, their parents' parents are dealing with poverty and there's been a mindset and a generation it's an inheritance of poverty they have inherited a mindset of poverty and now we have administrators whose hands have been tied by the system because parents either won't show up can't show up or don't care enough to show up to some of these um, uh, 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 forums or some of these meetings that they hold down at the Rochester, well, I live in Rochester, but at the district offices in these urban poverty-stricken neighborhoods. Where is the church? Are we praying for the administrators? Are we praying for the security guards? Are we praying for the people who are vicariously traumatized by the trauma that is affecting them and their students? I saw a teacher today war completely out, burnt out. And then people will push us and they will say, oh, well, the teachers aren't doing enough. The teachers aren't caring enough. The teacher, no, show up to the meetings. Show up to the school board meetings. Show up to the parent-teacher conferences. Show up to your child's school. Oh, well, I'm working and I can't do it. Listen, you can do a whole lot of other stuff. I see some of you at the club. I see some of you at the liquor stores. Come on. 
And you mean to tell me that for six hours a day, your child is in the company of other children. Your, your child, oh God, help me, Jesus. I hope I don't get in trouble for this. But your child is in the company of other children. Your child is in another school with other adults. And you mean to tell me that you don't, you don't have enough to put 15 minutes into your child's education? To find out what's going on? Come on, they send the letters home. So now you're going to put, don't put, don't, don't we dare put the blame totally on the city school district. Don't we dare totally blame the parents. Don't we dare totally blame the children. Don't we dare totally blame the teachers. Listen, it is a collective effort. All of us have to put our hand to the plow. Every single one of us. And don't you dare, and I don't know who this is for or who to share it, but don't you dare sit back and make it be somebody and make your child's education and your child's success be someone else's responsibility. No, it is their own responsibility. And let me just tell you this. When we look at Frederick Douglass, when we look at Frederick Douglass, a black man who was a slave, who educated Listen, this is what he stands for for me. He took the bull by the horns and he educated himself because he valued education so much so as to where he desired that if he was going to change the way that he was living, if he was going to change his surroundings and change the type of people that he was going to be surrounded by, he was going to have to educate himself. Let me tell you something, parents, people of God, educators, anybody, you have to let these children know that their education is important. I had a conversation with, with someone, one of them, and I said to myself, I said, and I told, told this individual, I said, if you want to change, I said, do you want to live the way that you are living right now for the rest of your life? You have the power, hey God. We have to tell them that they have the power to change their circumstances. But they have to stay focused. And it's hard. Here's the thing, people of God. Let me tell you, I did some research and it's in my book. There's a part of our brain that is called the hippocampus. It is responsible for learning and it's responsible for creating memories. It's responsible for retaining memories. And every time that we are traumatized, the hippocampus shrinks. It is also genetically inherited. So that means your mom's trauma affected your, these children. So I'm telling, so if we look at it this way, the mother's trauma affected the child and the grandmother's child trauma affected that child too. It's what we in the spiritual realm or some of us Pentecostals call uh, generational curses. But let's stop focusing on generational curses and begin to focus on the general inheritance and the generational blessings. Let me tell you, thank you, Father. And I'm making a reference because I don't have my Bible in front of me. But let me tell you about generational blessings. The Bible says when the people of Israel came out of bondage and came out of slavery and came out of oppression from Egypt, when those children of Israel came out of that bondage, Moses came down with the tablets and he says, and it said, and I, this wasn't even the first set of tablets. This was the second set of tablets because Moses had to go back up the, up the mountain to get another set of rules that the people could actually follow. But he said, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of slavery, who brought you out of bondage, who, who brought you out into a land and giving you a promised land. And he says, and I will not have, here it is right here, people of God, any other gods before me. Is it possible? Hey God, let me stop yelling. Is it possible? Is it possible that because we have made government systems our God, that we have replaced God? He says, if you obey my commandments, I will bless you to the thousandth generation. But if you disobey me, if you don't honor me, if you don't put me and put my name as great, if you don't acknowledge me first, I will curse you to the third and to the fourth generation. My question today for anybody who's watching, and I know I'm preaching to the choir right now, but for anybody who's watching, how, who is your God? Who is your God? 
Do you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength? Do you treat your neighbors as you treat yourself? Do you love your neighbor as you love yourself? Here's the problem right now that I'm finding out in our city schools is that the children don't love anything because they don't have, they don't know what love is. When has we shown them the love of God? These young people are being abused. They're being oppressed. They're having mindsets of poverty passed down to them. And there's only a remnant of, of us, remnant, a remnant that will actually rise up and survive. I, I, I feel like Jeremiah. I feel like Jeremiah. I feel like the weeping prophet. I feel like John the Baptist, uh, you know, calling for repentance, a voice in the wilderness. But I'm asking each and every person who has any influence over not just your child, but maybe your child's friends. Stand strong. Don't let your child succumb to the status quo. And I'm talking to myself. Don't let them succumb to the status quo. Let them be a leaders. Because here's the thing. The, those of us who belong to God, God says that you are a light on a hill. And no one can put any shade on it. He said, let your light so shine so that others will see the good work that God is doing in you. And they will begin to glorify God too. We have to instill that in our children. We have to allow them to let their light shine. And let them know that there is still light in them, even though they have been crushed, hard pressed on every side. But remind them that they are not destroyed. Here's the thing. Please pray for our teachers because here's the thing, people of God, they cannot reach out to us. But we can reach in. All they can do is call their parents. There's something going on right now in the Rochester City School District where we can't they can't suspend. They're trying to make sure that suspension rates are down and graduation rates are up. Here's the thing. I, 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 I'm not trying to get into much, too, but, you know, how do you, you, you can't suspend the ones that are preventing the kids from learning. But then the kids that want to learn can't graduate because they can't learn because you can't suspend the ones that are preventing the kids from learning. It's a vicious cycle. Where are the parents? Where are the parents that do have time? I'm not even going to say the ones, the ones that make excuses. Hey, you got your excuses. I hope they wash out in the end, right? You can't make it. It's at the wrong time. The time is not convenient. Oh, but you can check your Facebook. If you can check your Facebook, you can check your district website because that means you have internet on your phone. If you can check your Facebook, then you can go to Engage New York and find out how to help your child do their homework. You can go to YouTube and watch a video to find out how to help them. Now, if you don't want to, then how about letting someone who does do it? Here's the other part I want to talk about. I, I had the, 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 the blessing and the burden of listening um, as I was visiting a school to an administrator that I'll keep, you know, I, I was listening to an administrator and the parent, you could hear the parent yelling at the top of her voice, cursing at the administrators. I've heard teachers get cursed out by parents. I've heard parents come into different, a variety of schools, cursing, smelling like, let me, I'm just going to tell you the honest to God truth because this is my pastoral um, hat I got on right now. You, they smell like a pound of sour. I've heard, I've seen cars pull up to the schools to drop their kids off. The mother is screaming out of the window and cursing the kids out. Get the F out my car. You better make your ASS in the, in the school. You better not do this and you better not do that. And if I have to come up to the school, I'm going to beat your ASS and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm pulling my hair out because the car, the child is the three of them are walking into the school. The oldest one doesn't know what to do. The middle one is confused and the baby is crying. And I promise you they didn't eat breakfast. What are we going to do? 
My heart is breaking. My heart is breaking. I, I, I didn't even mean to be on this long. But what are we going to do? And these kids are not only, they're, they're being uh, uh, traumatized, re-traumatized every day because the parents don't even know how to deal with their trauma and they don't know how to deal with the trauma that was passed on to their parents. We need to break what we call a generational curse, an inherited mental illness. What are we going to do, guys? What are we going to do? The first thing we need to do is pray. Here it is. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves long enough to pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, right? What is the wickedness that we put other gods before God? We put other things before God. And I'm even talking about the city school. I'm even talking about the school districts. When did we get to the place to where now the kids, you know, if, if we pray to a certain uh, uh, representative or a certain prophet, let's put it in a safe term, that they can't. Here's the thing. They can. If someone comes in, gets permission from the school, permission from the parents, you can lead a, a prayer group with some young people and some, and some young people, some students. You can reach in because they don't know how to reach out. I'm, I, they don't know how. But are we so busy? Are we so busy that we're not reaching these young people? They don't know God. They don't know God. They don't know that there's hope. So there's, here's, here's some things that I said. I told, I told a teacher the other day, I said, it's one thing to be fearless and have hope. It's another thing to be fearless and hopeless. That's dangerous. And that's what we're dealing with in this generation. They're not only fearless, they're hopeless. We have to restore hope. We have to reignite a fire. I'm asking for help. I'm, I'm not even going to sit here. I, I rarely ask for help. I'm asking for help. I'm asking for help. I'm asking for you guys to pray. I'm asking for you guys to take five minutes. Five. Most schools start at 730. Most teachers arrive at 715. I'm asking Take something, one thing. If you if you don't have to pray for it all, pray for a teacher, pray for an administrator, pray for a child that didn't get breakfast. There is the, the Bible says that the harvest is plenty, the laborers are few. Don't only pray for your children when they go out the door, but pray that their that their that other children's lives will be touched as your child stands for Christ. I need you guys to pray. And then for those of you who can do something, we need you to do it. We do. Let me tell you something else. Your presence in the school, in, in, in a child's life is 99% of the work. Just seeing something consistent in a life of inconsistency. I'm trying not to break down. I'm trying not to break down. Pray for the teachers. Pray for those teachers that, that, that have to deal with the ratios of children on a repeated basis, five days a week, six hours a day. I've seen, I've, even as myself, I've had, I've had some students tell me to suck their stuff. I've had some, I've listened, as soon as I come into the school, they're cursing each other out. They're hitting each other. The sad part about it is half of the parents, you guys don't even know what's going on. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what's happening in the school. 
I, I've had, I've had, I've been called all kinds of names. There have been some days that I've lost it. There have been some days that I have called some names back. I'm going to be honest. And they said, well, I'm going to get my mama on you. And I tell them straight up and down, you sound like your mama. So I ain't worried about it. I already know what your mama going to say. There have been some days where I've had to actually respond that way to a 12-year-old. Think about that. 11 and 12 year olds. I've even seen third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders cursing, cursing people out. This is their language. Because they don't know God. They don't have any fear and they don't have any hope. I want to know how are we going to restore hope to this generation or is this just a lost generation? Do we just give up? Save who we can. Invite who we can. When you really love God, this kind of stuff breaks your heart. When you see a generation that has fallen hit God, just like the prophets, just like Isaiah, Micah, Malachi, all of them, uh, um, Hosea, all of them, Jeremiah, major prophets, minor prophets, they looked upon the reprobation of the people and they wept and they tried to warn. They tried to tell them, repent, turn from these ways, get involved with the school board, get involved. There's a school board meeting tonight. I'm going to go. We have Bible study. I'm so glad I have an assistant pastor. She's going to teach Bible study. Guess where I'm going to be? I'm going to be at the school board meeting. Not only as a parent. But as a leader in this community, we need to get involved, especially if you consider yourself being a pastor. You want to know how to keep your church surviving? You better grab this next generation. Because this is the church. Your pews are empty because the church has died. And everybody, don't, don't let me get on this, but I'm going to go with God on this. I'm going to go with God. Everybody's scrambling and fishing in the same pond for the same people. I don't want church people. And I definitely don't want churched people. I'm not fishing in the same pond for the same people. The same tithing offering, the same $20. I'm not looking for that. We need to reach outside the walls of the church. The institution. We need to become the ecclesial body. We need to become the light in this community. I'm probably preaching to the choir. I'm preaching to the choir. I already know. But somebody going to see this. And then some, some people ain't even going to share it. And that's all right. I don't care. Because I'll put it on YouTube. It ain't no problem. But the whole thing about it is we really need to get involved. Especially, especially the leaders. Especially the leaders. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it heartily as unto God. This is your reasonable service. Whatever you know how to do, teach these young people how to do it. Teach them how to read scripture. Teach them how to run a service. Let them sing their song. Be there. Be there. I think that's it. I hope that's it from the Holy Spirit. We really, really take five minutes. I'm, I'm meant to just really get on here and ask people. Take five minutes a day. Five, just five minutes in your car. In your Take five words. Lord, please touch the administrator. Lord, please touch the teacher today. Lord, please help the students today. To find you. And maybe you're the person they need to find. Just be present. You ain't got to say nothing sometimes. Sometimes you don't even have to say anything. I show up. Hi, miss. I say, hey, baby, how you doing today? I'm all right. I say, okay, you're going to have a good day. I'm going to try. I said, well, do your best. Hey, do your best. Give them a word of encouragement. Do your best. Try. Give it your best effort. One of them came up to me and said, miss, I messed up today. I said, well, you got tomorrow. Did you live? Yes. 
You got tomorrow, honey. Keep going, okay? I'm proud of you for what you did. You messed up a little bit. I'm a little disappointed at that. How do you feel about it? Let's work through it. Let's process it. It takes, this stuff takes time, but I promise you, the teachers don't have time. They are not social workers, psychologists, or, or, or anything. They're not parents. They are teachers. We are teachers. That's it. So we need some, we need you guys to get involved. We need you to get involved with your PTA, get involved with the local school. And if you don't have any children in the local schools, you still live in this local school. If you have a church in this, oh, now I'm getting on, I'm getting out, I'm getting out of pocket now. You have a church in the school district, near a school in the school district. Can you take 10 minutes out on your Bible study? Just to lift them up in prayer. So let's pray. I only got five people left and, and, and that's fine. I only started out with about the same five. So I love y'all. Thank you for hanging in there. And um, I'll wave to each and every one of you. But let's pray. Father, we come before you. First, thanking you for this day. This is the day that you have made. A day we have never seen before, a day we will never see again. Our country, our government, our school systems, hell, our whole world right now, I'm, we, the majority of us, God, are feeling the pressure. We don't know what to do. I'm going to be honest. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. And just like Jehoshaphat, when, when, the, when all the pressure was coming on every side, he said, God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We are looking up. We're looking to the hills from which cometh our help. And God, right now, I pray for every administrator in the city school districts. I pray for every teacher right now. I'm asking right now that you would touch them, that you would give them hope, that you would keep them strong, God, that everything that is vicariously traumatizing them, God, that you would give them strength, give them someone to talk to about it, give them an outlet, oh God. Because they are watching their students suffer and struggle to survive. And they, some of us, some of us as teachers feel helpless. Please, Lord, don't allow that helplessness to turn to hopelessness. Lord, we ask right now that you would allow, um, you would touch our school board. <laughs> That you would rise up people that are willing to advocate for our children and for our young people. No more status quo. That you would ignite us a, a spirit and a fire. That you would allow that the, the spirit of desperation hmm, would, would dispel from, from our city school leadership. I can feel the desperation sometimes. I'm praying for every pastor that has a church near a school that you would endow them with ways and methods to, to become proactive. I'm asking right now, God, that you would just give us strength to come together and to pray that you would equip us for the flood of people that are getting ready to come to our churches. I'm asking right now, God, that you would just bless each and every parent right now that is desperate, not knowing how to cope and how to deal with the inheritance of poverty, mental illness, disparity. They don't know what to do. And they are finding whatever ways they can to cope. I'm lifting those parents up right now. That they would turn down the ways of this world and find hope and salvation in you. Lord, I ask that you would allow us to, to get together and, and be able to, to collaborate as a unit, as a ministry. As a light for your people. That's it. 
I'm almost out of words, but it doesn't take much. We touch, we agree, and the Lord will, will make a way. So, thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. And um, please, please stay tuned with us um, February the 10th. It's the February the 9th. Uh, our church is doing a um, cope, uh, church and community uh, responding to childhood sexual abuse, disclosures, and domestic violence. Uh, learning methods and ways in which to respond, who to call, who to talk to. We need to be equipped. So I love each and every one of you. I thank you for staying on. And um, God bless you. May the Lord... Uh, with uplifted hands, without wrath, without doubting, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, majesty, and power, both now and forever. People of God said amen and amen. Love you all. God bless you.